What's up, everybody? Ryan from Sports Card Radio. Here again, another R-rated podcast. We've got several things to talk about, so we don't want to dilly-dally. Got to get right into it. Let me run down what I'm going to talk about here. The Tops Now lawsuit filed by attorney and Cardboard Connection writer Paul Lesko has been dismissed. We'll talk about that. Um, check out my cards Black Friday. Mentioned that as well on a previous podcast and what my strategy was. My strategy changed, of course. And so I'll talk about how checking my cards Black Friday went for me, what I did in terms of selling and buying, and then really my post Black Friday strategy, which can be equally or more important than what you did on Black Friday. I'll talk about that because I've had many years near now where I've sold on Black Friday and then seen the couple months after. Black Friday, December, and January, how those sales go. So I'll talk about my strategy there. Um, Again, uh, on a previous podcast, I talked about a sports business journal article, which is a great magazine. I just got my copy the other day. Just all kinds of good stuff in there. Uh, They had an article about Tops Now where there was a quote from Beckett that I thought um, was a little off. We'll review that quote, and then Beckett, Somebody from Beckett did get back to me, and so we'll share what they said. I can't even remember even how that went. That was a, that was about a week ago, so it tells you my time span or my uh, my mindset and my time span that I have going on over here. I can't even remember stuff that happened a week ago. Upper Deck is skipping, or uh, according to a written statement that they sent out to distributors and dealers, they are skipping the Las Vegas Industry Summit this year, and they will be hosting their own uh, diamond dealer. They're calling it a diamond dealer conference in Phoenix. So that's very interesting. On a side note, there is a card shop that is going. And um, I'll talk about how that particular card shop is going to help me refresh some articles that Colin and I um, have written over the years about card shops. And a lot of those articles still get a lot of interest, a lot of traffic. We still get emails and questions about those about uh, starting a card card shop, running a card shop. Some of those cards, those articles are kind of dated. I mean, Colin and I grew up uh, working in a card store. We had a card store for a couple years. That all ended in 2008, and now that's going on. You know, almost eight nine years ago now, over eight years ago now. So, you know the. That was before smartphones and social media and all these type of things. So it's good to get, I think, some of that content freshened up with a different perspective. And that's what we're going to do. And hopefully uh, that content could last another eight years because I probably won't update it for another 10 years. So um, I'll talk about how how that all went down. And um, that's about it. So we'll jump right into it. So. The Tops Now lawsuit. And if you didn't know how that all went down, uh, Paul Lesko, who is an attorney uh, and who I roasted on one of these shows the last, I mean, I just lit this guy up. Um, but I don't think I really talked about the lawsuit itself. Um, most of you familiar probably with Tops Now, They're, they put a card up for sale. And I believe, I hope I get this right. Uh, the they put on the card John Harrison when the guy is really Josh Harris Harrison of uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates but the, they originally put the photo uh ha, had his wrong name and Paul Lesko bought one of the cards and he even tweeted at them then that hey hey make sure that you send me this John Harrison and not a Josh Harrison because about a couple hours later they switched the photograph to the correct uh picture and, you know, this was like the day the card got sold. This was July 20th, I believe. And he was already kind of saying, hey, make sure you send me this error card. Well, you knew Tobbs wasn't going to do that. And they sent him a, a correct version, uh, correct version of the, the card. And less than 30 days later, he sued them. And which is incredible just to even think about that. Apparently... And I've been receiving updates about the case through the court itself. They have an email notification system. And it looks like, again, I'm not a lawyer. Don't pretend to be a a lawyer or a good lawyer. 
it looks like Lesko himself and his lawyer dropped this suit themselves. And it was once I got the notification, I was like, oh, that's interesting. This thing got dismissed. And Paul Lesko had actually written an article. And so I was like, oh, cool. He's going to clear this all up. <laughs> I found maybe this is an indication of, of my feelings about him as a lawyer and, and I guess as a person. I found the article to be very confusing. I couldn't figure out what had happened. I was like, I got an email saying the case dismissed. And then he's on there complaining about the blowback he got on Twitter from people. He's on there complaining about how expensive lawsuits can be and how time consuming they can be. But one quote that really struck me is he said, you know, I always want to resolve lawsuits out of court whenever possible. And and I was thinking to myself, he sued Topps 30 days after he got this card. So how much of a chance did he really give Topps to make this right? Or, you know, to do something for him to to make up for the fact that they can't send a look, guys. Here, here's one, and I don't know if this flies in court or not, but here's just the common sense approach to it. Tops is a partner with Major League Baseball. You think they could send out cards intentionally misspelling a guy's name? Does that make any sense at all? That you're a partner with a league, you basically have to suck the, the league's D-I-C-K every few years to get this exclusive license. You think they can willy-nilly just produce cards where their guys' names are misspelled? Do you, th- do you think Josh Har- Harrelson would want cards floating around with his wrong name? Of course not. So again, I don't know if that's a legal s kind of terminology, but it, it, it's just business, guys. He wasn't going to get that error card. And um, I found his, his rationale, just his article, very confusing. And I've always found it, some of his articles on, on Cardboard Connection confusing. I'm like, I, I left more confused than... <laughs> then I started. So my two points are, look, guys, he sued 30 days after the get it, getting the card. He he had no, and I don't think he did this for monetary reasons. I'm not actually really sure why he did this. Maybe to give uh, his buddy lawyer some pub and he felt like he was going to get some, some articles or some link backs or something. I, I, I don't think there was a financial motive for this. I don't think he really thought he was going to get the card. Maybe he really was bored. That's why in the article I wrote, I, I referenced maybe, you know, they were sitting around smoking weed and did this. That's the only, th- there certainly couldn't have been a financial motive. I know, you know, he sued him for $5 million. There's no, you know, I hope he's smart enough that he didn't do this for any kind of financial reason. I really hope he's smart enough. Because there was no way he was going to get a dime out of tops. So, um, you know, people question my motivation for things all the time. I mean, even today I was getting comments on Facebook about my motivation for things. So maybe it's pointless to even uh, be speculating there. But my other point about this is that customers pay for tops lawyers. So no matter how frivolous this was, or maybe this was just an, uh, you know, a quick email um, and, and the Topps lawyers had a good laugh about this. But think about this. Topps is located in Manhattan. Okay, these aren't Missouri lawyers. These aren't Stockton, California lawyers. These aren't your bump, country bumpkin lawyers. These guys are real lawyers who really make money. Topps has, uh, I'm sure, a set of them. And collectors end up paying for that. Collectors end up paying for that. So for L- Paul Lesko, who claims to be a collector, to f- just frivolous, you know, just willy nilly sue tops 30 days after he gets a card. Did he send him an email? Did he call him on the phone? Did he give him a shot? I mean, 30 days. Gosh, have you ever had a redemption card from tops? I mean, that could take six months, two years. So I don't, I don't know why he didn't give them a, a longer period of time to make this right for him. Well, I do know why, because this was told this, his motivation for this lawsuit was just total BS. And that's a shame. Ah, it just makes me sick that there are lawyers out there willing to do this. I mean, it's scary. It's scary. I mean, maybe he'll sue you next. Maybe you have a mislisted card on eBay. Maybe he's going to sue you next. Maybe you have a, a small website where you're selling cards. Maybe he'll sue check out my cards next. Just to, just for fun, just for fun. Maybe he'll sue me just for fun because that's what he did here. This was just for fun. He's, he, even in his article, he said, or what I did last summer, I sued Tops. 
That's not funny. That's not how the justice system works. That's disgusting, actually. It's disgusting. And I, hopefully Tops makes a fo- some kind of formal complaint against him. or I, They probably won't. I'm sure they won't because it's a complete waste of their time. They just laughed at this guy. Laughed at this guy. So it's disgusting. So he sued Tops 30 days after he got this card. And keep in mind that you as a customer, as a Tops customer, are paying for these lawyers that Tops. Even these most frivolous lawsuits that are five minutes out of the day. Well, five, five minutes out of a Manhattan lawyer's day, that's still a little bit of money. So it's disgusting. Um, and it sounds like if he wanted to just keep pursuing this, he could. He could have just kept pursuing this and kept, he would have had to start throwing some of his own money. He might have had to fly to New York a few times, however it had to work. But that's scary, guys. Because he could just sue you at any moment. He could sue check on my cards at any moment. He could sue Beckett at any moment. He could sue me at any moment. That's disgusting and that's wrong. Anyways, done talking about him. Let's talk about something positive like what happened uh, with uh, my check on my card sales over Black Friday. So on check on my cards for the week and the week started, they did like a Black Friday preview, which started 1121 and then it went through Cyber Monday, which was 1128. So one week. I was able to sell $226.16 worth of cards, and I sold 431 total cards, so that's good. I, if you remember on this podcast, I said anything, anything you, me personally, anything I sold is gravy. I expect to sell zero cards, but I just put a sale up, don't spend a lot of time on it, and if I sell something, great. So the fact that I was able to unload 430 cards and then also get $226 in my pocket, that's great. Now, I said on the podcast, oh, I'm going to go through and I'm going to buy... I'm going to have a list of names and, and buy all these cards and do this. Well, that, that didn't exactly, uh, that, that didn't exactly go down. Like most people, I get busy around, uh, you know, the holiday times and, and with working and, and, uh, you know, going and eating turkey, turkey and, and prime rib <laughs> didn't exactly have a whole lot of time to do really, frankly, any check on my card shopping, but I was like, you know what? I got to salvage this. And buy a portfolio or at least scope these portfolios. So every day I was looking for a portfolio and I found one that ended up being a, a tremendous deal. Um, it was about 556 ho- soccer cards, all soccer cards, all about like 2000 to current ML- tops MLS soccer cards and an upper deck MLS soccer cards. And it was 99, it was like $98 total. I've already sold a bunch a bunch of the cards actually probably priced them too cheap but I've actually sold a bunch of the cards already so I've actually got some of my money back. What I love about checking my cards and I want to drive this point home is if this guy walked into my card shop with those same 500 cards, there is no way in heck I would have ever gave him $98. I might have gave him $9.08. There were probably like 8 jer- maybe like 10 or 12 jersey cards. And then some of the cards were a little more nuanced. They had like serial numbers or maybe they were the right player and they were worth a couple bucks. But if this guy walked into my card shop or if I saw this guy to show, there is no way he would have ever in his life gotten $98. But I got a great deal. That's what makes checking my cards amazing is that it opens up this whole new marketplace where those soccer cards, yeah, he probably didn't make money. The guy who sold them to me didn't make any money, but I got a great deal. And never in his life, if he would have brought those cards to me in a, in a card shop, would I have paid him nine ninety eight dollars No way. No way. I would have maybe gave him 20 bucks for him because I knew I could have sold the jerseys for one or two dollars each, three dollars each. The rest, there would be a really hard sell, really hard sell. But on checking my cards, those cards move. Some of them are going to move on eBay. There's uh, not that many soccer cards. That's why I bought the portfolio. I love buying cards that aren't out there. I used to love buying hockey cards, but now with all the EPAC cards getting flooded on there so you have to find different things um so i found the soccer cards um so i didn't i didn't do a whole lot of buying i think there were some great opportunities to sit in there and buy refractors and buy serial number cards and buy jersey cards and just like i like what my plan was buy all these players and just stock up just didn't happen um i was able to buy that portfolio and maybe a handful of buster posies and a couple other players and that was it like that i didn't really spend much time on the site at all but that doesn't matter and i want to drive Another point I want to drive home is really the post Black Friday can be really good. My sales in December and January have always been really, really good. 
really good on check mark cards. Those are sometimes my best months, better than even the November month. People are sitting around, they have money, they want to spend some money on themselves, especially in January. And a lot of times you can get rid of some of these cards. So what I did, I, I ended up having, I had over a thousand dollars. So then what happens? Some uh, uh, these sellers, they get these, you know, somebody like me who sold 430 cards. They're probably people who like murdered it and who were selling cards all day. And it was a really fun thing and it can get kind of addicting selling that many cards every day. Well, once Cyber Monday turned off, oh, your sales probably went back to what they were. And that can have a real interesting effect on sellers and they can get kind of nervous and they want that feeling of selling cards again. And I know that. I know that from the years. The, sometimes the best time to buy cards is even in the weeks after Black Friday because pe- sellers get impatient. They've maybe dumped off as much inventory as they can. And now they're willing to really dump off the stuff that didn't sell really cheap. And I'll, that's when, yes, I will take those cards. So I've bought two portfolios since Black Friday. I bought an all Pokemon. I think it's all Pokemon. I haven't finished pricing it yet. I think I bought that the day after uh, or, or like the day after Cyber Monday. Uh, I think it was about six or seven hundred cards. All Pokemon Yu-Gi-Oh! Again, that is the exact same reason why I bought the soccer portfolio. There's not that many cards on there. And it looks like I got a pretty... Those those Pokemon cards are going to take a while to sell. Probably even longer than the soccer cards. But, you know, there's not that many Pokemon Yu-Gi-Oh! cards on the site. So I'll take those. I think I paid... I can't remember. I think I paid couple hundred for that yeah because there were some there were some rare ones and some of the foil ones so i paid a couple hundred for that and then i paid i think about four and a quarter 450 for kind of a mixed bag mostly baseball it had a Corey seager autograph had a lot of lower end cards which obviously i sell more more of um refractors and stuff and more modern stuff really actually some more modern stuff 2015 2016 um stuff so, and I paid four and a quarter for that. And that had like 1200 cards. I'm not even through pricing all that yet either. So that, that can take forever. So I haven't, I bought these cards and I haven't been able to price them yet, but some of them are selling, even the ones I'm pricing, I'm selling. So, and I'm looking to buy some more. I'm looking to buy some more portfolios. I'm too lazy now. Unfortunately, I go through these stretches with checking my cards where I'm too lazy to go through and even look for individual cards. So now once or twice a day, I'll check the portfolios. That's, that's all you really have to do with the portfolios. Check once or twice a day make some offers. Um, try never to, my advice is try never to really insult somebody or lowball them. If, if, if you don't feel like you can meet their asking price, don't, uh, don't insult them. But you know, if, if somebody has a port listed for a thousand, there's a pretty good chance they're going to, they would take four or 500. So whatever they have, you know, that they want for it. A lot of times you can get it for a lot less, especially if you've noticed that the port has been sitting there for a while. And that's usually what I like to do. Um, there's a lot of little port strategies. Maybe I should get on sometime since now it looks like maybe I'm going to buy a few. I bought three in the last week. So maybe I should get on here, uh, and talk about that. My, you know, what I'm looking at my strategies in that, in that regard. Cause I, I don't have the time right now to just sit around and pick off individual cards. So I don't think I'll be doing that. So looks like ports only for me. Um, oh, one other thing I have on here is I think. You know, once he changes his fee structure, which I think is coming soon, I think he has to do it. Um, that'll be really interesting. And then once I analyze that and study that and figure out how I'm going to do it, these Black Friday sales, and, and he does one in like spring spring cleaning, I think sales, these become way more important for me because there's going to come a time where I'm going to want to unload 5,000 cards in a week. And do that over a Black Friday weekend or do that over a, a, a spring cleaning. So that was one thing that I became conscious of is that, well, you know, once once this new fee structure comes into place and if it does, you know, I'm way overexposed here. I've got about 35,000 cards. If I feel like, ah, oh, man, I don't want to I just too many cards or the fees changed. I'm going to really take advantage of these Black Fridays and these spring train and these spring cleaning sales to just unload stuff. And I'm talking about blow stuff out. Um, I'm already way up on um, my checkup. I mean, I'm up thousands of dollars in free cash flow. Every card, I did a a 30 minute YouTube video where I basically broke down this whole account. 
I'm literally free rolling on every single card that I have. Little, it's a literal free roll. Every single card has been bought and paid for and I've already made thousands of dollars of profit. So I could take advantage of these Black Fridays and these spring cleaning trails and just blow stuff out because it's just straight cash in my pocket at the end of the day if you're, if you're looking at it from a bottom line revenue standpoint. So, you know, once he changes his fees, I'll definitely be on this show talking about that and then and talk about my new strategy. But for now, buying portfolios, going to just keep selling cards here and there. And um, hopefully Black Friday was good for you, either buying or selling uh, or both. And uh, definitely, it's a definite, you definitely want to keep using the website. I know I'm selling cards every day on eBay and even Amazon, especially now with Amazon. A lot of people ordering on Amazon for Christmas. So for sure, turn your eBay and Amazon sales on if you can, because every day I'm, get, I'm getting ticks on, on eBay and Amazon selling random stuff. So you certainly don't have to have the hot players or, or, the, or the most current stuff. Believe me, I, I have the junkiest of junk on there and it sells. Delman Young cards sell, you know, guys who you, you haven't heard of in 10 years, their cards still sell, guys. It's not all about Dak, Dak Prescott and Ezekiel Elliott, you know, believe it or not, you know, junk sells. And, you know, I just sold 430 pretty much junky cards. I mean, I didn't, I don't really have anything good. You can go through the whole portfolio, Sports Card Radio, I mean, on checking my cards. There's nothing really good that I have, but the stuff sells. So that's, the again, another beautiful thing about checking my cards. Um, so there you go. That was my Black Friday. Kind of rekindled some things. It just amazed me that I bought those soccer cards for 98 bucks, and I felt like I got a great deal when in real life, if he brought those cards to me, those cards are worth $9.50. So think about that. That's how amazing Check Out My Cards is. And uh, hopefully that continues on in the future. Okay, let's uh, talk about... Uh, Becca did respond to me about this quote in Sports Business Journal. Here was the quote. Uh, this is from Brian Fletcher from Beckett Media. This was in the article about Tops Now. And uh, the article was basically kind of a fluff piece just saying how well Tops Now did. did. And uh, here's the quote. There was, some, there was some hesitancy initially with this product, particularly if you look at some of the lower initial print runs early in the season. Brian Fletcher, senior market analyst for Beckett Media, which produces trading card publications and provides a card grading service and a marketplace. But people have figured it out, and we've seen interest really grow around Tops Now. They've really hit on something here. So I asked them about this. I said, I said, you know, were the print, I asked Beckett, were the print runs really lower early in the season? I said, the quote implies the program gained momentum. And so they responded. They said, one quick, they said, one quick metric of the first 100 tops now baseball cards, 12 had print runs higher than 1,000. The final 100 of they said 40 of them had print runs. And I was like, oh, wow, that's crazy. I said, wow, I must, I read it wrong. So I went back to their own website and I counted up. This is, this is a perfect example of how cards can be kind of confusing. I counted up all the print runs in September and I only saw five cards with print runs over a thousand. Like the, the print runs in September were dismal. And so I responded back. I said, in September, I see five cards with print runs over a thousand less. I'm reading it wrong. And then they responded back, no, the regular set continued through the end of the World Series. And I was like, oh, I was like, so they're counting all the Cubs cards that naturally um, ha did have some good print runs. And so I responded back. You, I, I said the Cubs probably helped. I said, imagine if it were the Marlins. I said most print runs are low compared to those in some respect. And so what I meant by that was, well, I guess you could look at the entire season compared to the playoffs and the Cubs sprint runs in the playoffs. And the entire season was pretty low. Um, here's the way the program should work is in the beginning of the season, they should have some high, uh, they should have some high print runs because one, there's a lot of interest in baseball around opening day and the season starting. Every team is zero and zero. Every team is in it. Every team is excited. Every team might've gotten some new players or a new prospect. Everybody's excited. So the program should do really well initially, which I actually think it did. And then during the dog days of the summer, when teams start falling out of the race and Padre fans exit the building and, uh, you know, count, countless teams across the league, their fans exit the building because their team is out of it. Um, 
or not doing very well, those it's going to be tougher to sell those cards because the Cubs, you know, Chris Bryant is going to hit a home run every day. Some days it's going to be BJ Upton or it's going to be some random guy um, that that naturally those cards aren't going to sell as much. And then there should be a ramp up toward the end of the season when now the teams that are in it are playing important games and having big moments and those fan bases are engaged. So you should be able to target those fan bases and sell some cards into them. I mean, like the Cubs. I mean, if you can sell a thousand Cubs cards, I mean, if you can sell a thousand Cubs anything after they won the World Series, I mean, you're, you're crazy. So the way the program should work is huge ramp up in the beginning, selling lots of cards, dog days of summer, maybe you cut back on the number of cards you're doing and, and you try to highlight key moments and then toward the end of the season you really target the teams and the markets that are really doing well because even if the Indians had won clearly they wouldn't have had the print runs that um, the Cubs would have had but there would have been some engagement there there would have been a lot of excited Indian fans all across the country who the team had finally won the World Series after all these years and they would have been super excited I saw the same thing happen with the San Francisco Giants Um, I mean the whole area blew up I mean it was you know Giants everywhere so that happens, that happens in, in most markets when a team, you know, wins the World Series because it's so difficult. I mean, ask the Cubs, ask the Indians, ask the Giants before 2010. It's difficult. It's emotional. It's, it's a ride. So you should be able to sell some cards toward the end of the season. That's when the print runs should. should. So I just hope that, uh, you know, my, my point was, hey, the, I think when you, when you compare tops now to E-tops, and the Bowman exclusives on the pit, yeah, the sales to me are pretty lackluster. But if you just look at the program for what it is, you know, in today's market, it should do really well at the beginning of the season. It should fall off for a long stretch, probably from after the All-Star game till, Jesus, through September maybe. You're going to have some dog days of, of low tops now print runs. And then it should ramp up as those... Uh, that are in the playoffs, their their fan bases and their markets are excited and they're playing exciting games and exciting things happen, big moments happen. Um, so they they were looking at the print run through the playoffs, whereas I think even if even if they were looking at it through their lens that the, that the playoffs counted as the original set, I think his quote is still misleading because you could compare you could compare the uh, the playoff print runs to the rest of the season and they look low compare the playoff print runs to September. So he, he said, Oh, there was initial hesitancy in the product. No, the print runs were at the lowest in September. And in the dog days, there wasn't initial hesitancy that the pro- program did pretty well. And I'll be curious to see what it does next year. It should do. It, it should do well out of the gate. Now they've got a year in, they've got some exposure. Some people can see what these cards are selling for the year prior. Big players, rookie cards, big moments. Um, those cards are probably worth more than four or five bucks at this point. So they should do really well at the beginning of the year. Everybody's excited. Everybody's in it. And um, so I hope, I hope when, you know, again, I really love Sports Business Journal. So I hope when they call somebody like Beckett Media or they call somebody from, you know, if they call you guys, just be honest. You don't have to sugarcoat stuff or, you know, there's no, there's no reason to do that. There's no reason to do that. You can still put a lot of positive spin on tops now without really sugarcoating. And maybe he really didn't analyze the market. That's what I think. It's just kind of like, you know, one of these things where he, he actually didn't analyze the program. Maybe this guy called him and he had to come up with a quote right then. He couldn't say, Hey, give me 15 minutes. Let me look at these print runs and then let me get back to you. You know, I don't know. I don't know. So I don't know really what happened there. Um, Again, uh, just be honest, especially when, you know, somebody like Sports Business Journal calls you or a newspaper. Let's just be honest. Talk about cards in an honest way. That's going to help grow the market. That's going to help inform people. Again, listen to every PSA conference call. The CEO always talks about information drives collecting. So let's give them the right information. Let's give them, you know, information that's actually actionable and usable. And not something that's just pulled out of your butt just to sound good for the author or sound good for tops for whatever reason. So Beckett, you should owe no loyalties to tops whatsoever. Like t- unless tops is sending you a check. So probably not. So just be honest, inform people. And trust me, a lot more people will be coming to the website and subscribing or how, you know, grading cards or whatever the monet- monetization scheme is.
upper deck is reported. They're not publicly saying, but they are have written that in a public statement to dealers and distributors that they will be skipping the industry summit, or they certainly won't have a, a big a presence there this year, and they're going to host their own conference in Phoenix, Arizona, July, uh, January 11th and 12th, 2017. Gosh, this would be fun. This would be a lot of fun. Two-day conference. I bet it's going to be kind of a lot like the summit. Obviously, it's going to focus all on their products and and um, how to drive you know, sales into your store. This would be a lot of fun. I encourage if you have a store or you're thinking about, I bet you can, they say that you have to be a diamond dealer to get into this. Um, I doubt it. I bet if you call an email and said, Hey, I'm thinking about opening a store, they're going to let you in. It's 99 bucks. They have a deal with a Sheridan grand. That was like, I don't know about 200 a night. You could definitely find rooms cheaper than that in that area. But uh, 200 a night at, at the, at the venue itself isn't bad at all. Um, should be lovely weather. Ah, I wish I could go to this. I'm so sad that I'm like uh, not a not a diamond dealer anymore. I have absolutely no reason to go to this. Like there's uh, certifiably no reason for me, but um, would be fun. And I certainly you're if you go to this, you're probably going to get so much free stuff that it's going to at least comp your your flight it's at least comp your hotel the hotel is like five minutes from the airport literally or you want to fly into uh, sky harbor fly in there take southwest if you can that's usually a hub there and usually you can find good good rates there and if you're like me you can fly southwest and take somebody for free oh just gotta throw throw that out there a lot but um yeah so fly southwest take that in there go to the the thing so that'd be fun looks like they're skipping the industry summit that is really interesting for a number of reasons because that means they got upset you don't just skip the industry summit now i bet at the end of the day somebody will go down there and and they'll have you know have a little meeting somewhere down there they'll send one one or two employees but in the past they've done some big things there so you know that uh Ke another thing that kevin isaacson has blundered over there he got record attendance Thanks to, you know, the rise of kind of social media and really some hot card years there, 2012, 2011, 2012 there. And he banned me. He banned Brian Gray, who owns Leaf Trading Cards. He banned uh, Brian Price, who owned uh, In the Game Trading Cards. Um, he might have banned a few other people, but he started banning people. Then he took the conference over to Hawaii, which is like a 10 hour flight for anybody on the East Coast. For me, that's not I mean, it's a five hour flight. It's certainly not something I want to get out of bed and do. But somebody on the West Coast, it's not a bad flight. I think about anybody past California. That's a long way to go for this stupid conference in Hawaii. So stupid choice to move. If anything, you should have moved it to the East Coast. Had done it in New York or Boston or Omaha or Chicago or uh, Dallas or anywhere. I mean, um, so that was a bizarre thing to do that. I don't know what. The direction of, of that is that could be a really cool conference that could be a thing where a lot of positive things get get uh, a lot of positive things happen and uh it's really become kind of a closed off event funny thing is if you wanted to go but trust me you could sign up and go you as a collector you as a regular joe um now you might get banned later on but there's no restriction i think uh, uh, for many years there was kind of this and maybe they purposely that oh you had to be within the industry to, no you you just sign up on the website and show up trust me they'll, they're not going to kick you out now they may kick you out when you sign up the next year but uh probably if you just uh just toe the line and you know play the corporate game you you you, you know it's going to be fine but without upper deck this year that's really interesting um there's some behind the scenes uh, there's some behind the scenes, scenes scenes things going on there. That's really interesting. Um, be interesting to see what the presence of Tops and Panini. Panini usually has a big presence there. They're usually sponsoring that thing. But uh, the fact that Upper Deck isn't going, there could be a lot of reasons for that. But none of them are good for the industry summit. None of them. None of them. To not have Upper Deck going there, who are really have some momentum behind them with EPAC, and um, even though they're trying to blow that, but. Just some things going on there that are good and positive. So, but it's really cool. Diamond Dealer Conference. If you can go July 11th through the 12th, highly encourage it. Um, I wish I could be there. But I do know somebody who is going to go to the Diamond Dealer Conference. It is Section 
112 sports card and memorabilia store in Valley Park, Missouri. And he has agreed, um, after talking kind of about the conference a little bit, um, he's going to help help me out um, probably next year. You know, it's so busy for these shops. Who He does online stuff too. It's so busy during Black Friday and these Christmas times to really get a whole lot of things done. But I'm just going to call him and probably t- talk to him for about an hour or so, an hour and a half and about his card shop and how he got started and kind of the ongoing day-to-day about it and try to put together some more current articles about you know that startup process when you're when you have that initial idea about starting a a card store um and then actually following through opening the store and then the day-to-day kind of piece after that i know he sells on ebay sells online and stuff his website is section 112 stl.com valley park missouri my cousin just spent a bunch of time in missouri and was like Tell me how awesome it was. He wanted to uh, wanted to move there. So really cool. Look for those. Probably, I don't know. Uh, I might even let him let him go to the upper deck thing in Phoenix. Come back, digest all that. Then we can have a conversation and, and talk about kind of it all rolled into one. Maybe what's after going to the conference, what's his plan going forward? What are some of the things he's going to implement? I think that would be interesting to know. Um, but just really basic there, there are a lot of people who do think about opening a card store, whether it's a physical one, whether it's one online, whether it's just, you know, a combination of some other type of business. There, there are lots of people out there who, who think of that idea um, so and are always looking for information. Obviously, that's a very niche kind of thing. So any type of information they can get, any type of just advice, I think that's a really good thing. It would have helped me back in my day if I would have had just, uh, uh, you know, some words of of wisdom maybe for somebody who's who who had done it uh or had been doing it a long time uh working in a card store is m- certainly much different than kind of starting one up from scratch so look for those uh probably sometime next year as far as sports card uh, radio goes my brother set that website up i think before smartphones were invented or had just been invented and um for the time and for many many years it was really it, it it was great unfortunately the platform that he set it up on it was weird that was the only website that either of us have that was ever set up in joomla was that website every other website has been some other different platform uh, predominantly wordpress if you're like blogging and stuff you probably um more than likely use something like wordpress but set it up in joomla and uh worked really well but it joomla has become outdated so my brother had one of his guys in the summer switch over the site to wordpress and uh that went that went actually remarkably pretty smooth we knew that some of the formatting on some of the pages were going to be off and um it was just uh it's just a little tedious there's 18 there's over 1800 articles on sports card radio um we didn't feel like having any of our people con has some people that do stuff for him work for him i have some people work on my sites and stuff we didn't feel the the need to have anybody work on it we felt like eventually we would get around to kind of fixing this stuff i found kind of a workaround to break up some of the basically what i had to do was break all these old tables we set up in joomla break all those old tables and then what it boiled down to is whether with these minor spacing issues on each page or just about every page um 1800 of them that yeah they only take about 30 seconds to fix but you got 1800 pages at 30 seconds each i thought about timing that out and paying somebody but i actually wanted to go through the website and and i mean there's 1800 articles a lot of that were stuff that colin and i actually did ourselves which is crazy to think about that we actually sat there and and did all this work on cards. Um, uh, One thing, uh, again, I've created over 1,800 pieces of content just on Sports Card Radio about cards, so I kind of know a little bit about promoting cards and websites and stuff. One thing I want to really point out is that contests are probably the worst return on investment you could ever have in your life. I I was going through a bunch of pages that we did in 
looked like 2010. We had all these contests, and I was like, oh my god, what a giant waste of time those were. Uh, aside from the videos that still are up and still get viewed, and nobody's going back and visiting those pages with, with contest results or anything like that, and all that time it took to pack and ship all that stuff, and sometimes people sent us stuff, wanted to open stuff and kind of promote them. Oh, the worst waste of time. The worst waste of time. Now, maybe back in those days, the web was a little bit different. There wasn't this huge adoption of smartphones and stuff, and people were consuming their information differently. People were Googling stuff a lot more. Um, I think we're going to see a big, big change, big change. Uh, all I see, I was at a college basketball game, and during the break, I look over and look over at the band and there are about 15 members of the band and 14 of them are on their cell phone. So I think, and I guarantee none of them are on Google. Uh, people are consuming their information different. They're getting it from uh, Facebook or Snaps or Twitter or Instagram or whatever or however they're consuming it. And I think eventually there's going to be really good AI either on your computer or something you talk into to say, pull up the 1954 Tops checklist. Or I'm looking for this car. Or maybe you can just take a picture of a card and it'll the the web will be able to digest that and bring up the information. I don't I think uh, and Google knows this. I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of searching back when Colin and I set up the website. That was the game. You set up these websites and you rank in Google and da 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 da. That's changing by the day. Um, I mean, I have websites that get more. I in, uh, just for example, I have a website that gets more traffic than Beckett and Cardboard Connection combined. Because you can buy all this traffic so cheap now. Forget ranking in Google. Who cares about where you rank in Google? Just buy this traffic for pennies on the dollar, either on Facebook or Twitter or Pinterest or Instagram. I mean, th they're selling this stuff dirt cheap. And if you come up with a good ad, it actually gets cheaper. They actually encourage you to come up with really engaging ads so that then your ad gets actually like minuscule cheap. My buddy showed me a campaign that he ran that he got. Oh, my God. It was like astonishing. He got like... I was so jealous. He got like 300,000 likes on something on Facebook and his cost per uh, click to his website ended up being like a fraction of a cent, a fraction of a cent. He got hundreds of thousands of subscribers. He got thousands of likes on Facebook. He got 300,000 likes on one post. His stuff went like straight viral for the niche he was in <laughs> and he got uh, for fractions of a cent fractions of a cent each for I mean it's astonishing the type of reach you can get um you certainly aren't going to have that type of you know you're not going to get 300,000 likes on your you know whatever you post every time but uh it's the incremental stuff uh the small incremental you know subscribers and being able to turn that around and monetize that and stuff so a lot of that stuff is just blowing up. I mean, these kids are on their phone all the time and they're sharing stuff and they're liking stuff and and it's it's incredible. So it's certainly much different. Uh, that's a long kind of winded way to say, you know, I, I'm definitely going to bring, you know, sports car. We're going we're gonna to bring sports car radio in the 21st century and update all the content. We owe it to ourselves for all this work that we did back in the day to bring this content up, make it useful on a phone, make it useful on a desktop. As far as ongoing content and posting new content, it's just so hard. It's hard to blow up something in Sparks Cards. It's hard to get a uh, 100,000 hits in a day in something on sports. That's, a, oh, that's virtually impossible. I mean, I think it is impossible. You couldn't get 100,000 hits to a page I just can't think of something that would draw that type of interest. Like, I mean, unless you paid out the nose for it. And even then, I just, I don't know where you're going to get all that traffic. Other niches, other things, it's worth the time to do that. Um, so for for the time being, um, we're probably not going to be consistently working on the website, but there'll be podcasts and a little more free-flowing kind of content and stuff. Anytime there'll be, you know, there'll be a lawsuit that'll dismiss. I mean, certainly by some guy who works at Cardboard Connection. Woo, that's right up my alley. But uh, once that dies down and, and all that goes away, be a little more just free-flowing, stuff we're interested in. Maybe we'll post some content. There's always people who do reach out to me and say, oh, I want to work on the website or I just want to do some stuff. Sometimes we let people just post some stuff if, if they want to do it and uh, post links to uh, other website. One page 
probably there'll be a couple pages we do update it'll be a release date calendar which i know is useful and people find useful i've had people like email me when i st- when we stopped updating the release date calendar i mean i had a lot, like all these people like why'd you stop why'd you stop and it's like whoa dude like because because it's just not worth updating i mean the the you know you can get three hundred thousand likes on a, on a you know for a a fraction of a penny le- each. And, you know, I've got to keep up with what Tops and Panini are doing on these stupid release dates and all these other companies. I mean, it's, it's tedious, but I do see the value in it. So I will put somebody on that um, to update that. I'll have to train them in in the card game. But usually I get emails. I don't know why Tops and, P- Tops and Panini, why they don't do this themselves. Again, you listen to every single collector's universe conference call which has been making money quarter over quarter for six straight years six straight years they say information drives collectibles where's the release date calendar on tops website where's the release date calendar on the panini's website in the blog where is that where is that isn't that important isn't that one of the most important things to know when do these cards come out where can i buy them how much will they be what's inside of it very simple things that they could provide. For some reason, they choose not to. Again, they wonder why vintage cards have blown up. And, uh, you know, sometimes these modern cards fall flat on their face. Anyways, hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Hope you didn't sue anybody. Don't sue Tops. Give them, 30 di- give them more than 30 days before you sue them, before you sue Panini. But uh, keep them on their toes. But give them a little more than 30 days next time. Give them a few months to work that out. My best advice. See you guys later. Take it easy.